a very short and very warm welcome from the side of the German Film Museum. I'm very, very glad to have these special guests to mo this morning here and thank you also for the audience to come at this time in the morning to the Film Museum with the snow outside. Um, so a very warm welcome to Jonas Makers, to his son Sebastian and to Douglas Gordon. Hi, he's in the, in the back of the... Yeah. So it has been two years only that um, Jonas was the last time here. Um, he was presenting here the, his book, um, a scrapbook from the 60s, um, two years ago, and um, today it will be about his first book, I Had Nowhere to Go. And I will hand over the microphone to Kathy Gordon. Thanks, Natasha. <laughs> Good afternoon and welcome from B3. It's an honor to welcome Jonas Mikas, who is the B3 Lifetime Achievement Awardee. And he will speak after the film with Douglas Gordon. They'll have a Q&A, so please linger with us. Can you hear me? <laughs> the reputation and biography of Jonas Mikas is well known and in B3 publication and online. Yes, Douglas Gordon. <laughs> Tell me you were going to be here. <laughs> 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 Douglas we go back a long way. <laughs> Fuck me. Uh, <laughs> shit. <laughs> we, we are not related, but his mother thinks I may be their missing daughter. And Douglas Gordon was my first big show at the Smithsonian Hirshhorn Museum. And the night of the opening, which was a full floor of his retrospective to date, I was rushing to the, the, the opening, and the guard said, don't rush. Let me look at you. And <laughs> the guard said, don't me. rush, because there's no power in the museum, <laughs> and for the whole block yeah. of all the museums of the Smithsonian. And I took a deep breath, and I called Douglas, and most artists would be furious and hysterical, and you let out the best belly laugh I've ever heard in my life. <laughs> Can I try that again? Ha, 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 ha! So indeed... Which is actually a quotation from Jonas Makers. <laughs> and Shit. then I was telling what Jonas this morning... Here? Jesus Christ. ...that I was introducing a Douglas Gordon film, and I had um, five breaks in my ankle and was on crutches. <laughs> And, and my beloved name, name, name sharer came up and yanked my crushes away and said, look, a miracle. You know, I don't know if you guys know this thing. It's a TV show in Britain called This Is Your Life. <laughs> this is your life. Now I have to calm down, but I can't calm down. <laughs> I haven't no, seen this woman for years. Stay with me. Stay with uh, uh, me. As I was about to say, <laughs> um, you know the biography of Jonas Mikkelsen until, and, and before this turns into the Gordon family story, <laughs> I wanted to tell you five things you may not know about Jonas Mikas or may not have thought of him in this context. Jonas, you th this have. is your life. This is your life. <laughs> Actually, it's not. <laughs> Number one, Jonas Mikas. Wait a minute, how long have we got? Very short. Because <laughs> the movie's long. No, I'm, I'm taller than that. But you can go after. <laughs> Number one, Jonas Meek is, is a liberator. His work ref insists that the stuff of life is what the stuff of art can be made out of. And without sprucing up or affectation, his bald truths speak volumes. Would you agree? He's got more hair than me. <laughs> but you're taller now, right? <laughs> <laughs> Number two, <laughs> before Nike coined the phrase, just do it, I think that has been the ethos of Jonas's life. And today at 95, in, in keeping with his founding of Anthology Film Archive in New York, he's also raising money to create an archive library on the top floor and a cafe hotspot for, for uh, the anthology. He has been as dedicated to promoting the work of others as he has been to his own poetry. I'm going to try and put you off by tickling you. <laughs> I'm not that ticklish. 
Oh, really? <laughs> also, something that you, I think, really depict in the film is that Jonas Mikas is a performance artist. And what I mean by this is I had him come to Washington to speak, and it was supposed to be sort of a lecture, and he carried a big book up onto the lectern and put it down and opened and then just intoned from his diaries. And it was the most stunning performance I remember in over 30 years of working in the museum. And this is what I feel that you caught for posterity in your film, this performance, performative dimension. And also, Mikas is a chronicler and has made it into an extreme sport. And with his keno eye, he caught the casual grace of our times and have made them into history. And please, please, please see the overview of his films that are in the B3 Center. There's a really great selection. And you can go into history and back out of history. It's a beautiful, beautifully presented. And we thank Chip, uh, Pip Chodorov for helping us make that happen. And finally, Mikas is the precursor of selfies. Several of his films, as you will see, are durational selfies. And you know, Kim Kardashian made this book that was 365 days of selfies. I think Jonas Mikas may have that many hours in footage with less vanity and much, 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 much more poetry. This is, if you don't know already, <laughs> beloved Scottish artist Douglas Gordon. And he took the book by the same title, I Had Nowhere to Go, in the creation of this film, so please linger after and shake these guys down <laughs> for some Q&A. Thank you. <coughs> okay, a very warm welcome to Jonas Makers, Douglas Gordon, and Kelly Gordon. <laughs> Please take your seat. guys battle it out here. I'm here for water. I have to give you guys water as you need it. I don't like to sit down. You ready to stand up? <laughs> uh, questions? Yes, any questions? Because we have nothing much to say. <laughs> we said it there. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. It's oh. Well, my question was to go on because um, his film seemed like an anti thesis of sorts to Jonas Mika's films, which are full of images. Um, and you have a lot of black screen, so my my question would have been, why did you choose for this approach without um, saying one is better than the other? But I was very uh, interested in seeing Jonas Mika's work and then yours, which kind of seem like two completely different approaches. I don't think it's an antithesis at all. I think that this film is full of image. You just don't see it there. Yeah. I totally agree with you. <laughs> Douglas, there's the there's the YouTube where you talk about the buried in images uh, the, of of um, materials of the background of Jonas's life, and that you wanted to reference that something that was more obscure and secretive, and bring that as part of the wider array of uh, 
Did I say that? That's an yeah, it's on it's on it's on YouTube. It's <laughs> way too intelligent for me. That must have been on a good day. And you also wait in this. You also claim that you can imitate Jonas. So I think that we <laughs> only after twelve o'clock. <laughs> Fair enough. In the evening. I'm Fair about. enough. But no. I, I... <laughs> what was the most complicated uh, part of? Let me finish. Oh, sorry. <laughs> These things take time, and that's, for me, what's interesting. All my girlfriends interrupt me. <laughs> it takes time. Sometimes you have to close your eyes in order to get the sense of where you are, what you've been thinking about, before you opened your eyes and what you think you'll think about when the eyes are open. And when I read Jonas' book, okay, now I can speed up. Okay, Sorry, it sorry for me, it's a bit emotional, the film. Jonas gave me the book and I was traveling from Berlin to Frankfurt because I apparently teach here. And as I was arriving in Göttingen, he... And that's where we have basic difference, you teach, and I am against teaching, so... But continue, <laughs> please. <laughs> now, I, back I on the, I, I back I pretend, to the train. I pretend, I pretend to teach. <laughs> I arrive in Göttingen, as I'm opening a page where Jonas and Adolphus are arriving in Göttingen. And I thought, there's nothing predetermined about this. It happened. And I told him about it. And I said, I think this is really fucking incredible that I arrive in Göttingen as I'm reading about you arriving in Göttingen. And the distance between my life experience, your life experience, our time experience. Clearly, we were meant for each other. Can I say that again in a more English voice? Clearly, we were meant for each other. And that's why I thought it was important to make this film. Because there were too many crossovers not to do it. If I hadn't done this... And about the, this thing and how uh, opposite what I am doing and what Douglas is doing. You see, it's not that at all because cinema is not only about the images that you see on the screen, but also... Uh, the, uh, what's around, what's behind, what uh, the aroma, the, the, uh, there is something else that floats about and transcends those images, and that's where we meet on that level, and there is no opposition. Next. Uh, yes, M Mr. Mekas, um, the story of a displaced person actually is quite hard to get. And what is really a mystery to me is, did, I mean, did I get it correctly that it took about four years until you could leave Europe? And why was this so? I mean, uh, g generally speaking, would America have you, would have had you earlier what was the process or is it just a matter of survival so these things are I, I mean i'm i'm aware that of course the film doesn't want to tell certain things it keeps holds things back it but, has but nothing to do you, with wanting or not wanting okay could but but could you add to this you see there, there was such a thing as the second world war after the war ended, there were 18 million, 18 million displaced f persons, uh, uh, people, uh, 
brought into Germany for forced labor uh, for all kinds of purposes. And it took four years, five years, to disperse, to, to take them. Not all of them want, if they were from the Soviet Union, they did not want to go back there. No. They were, uh, and it took time for disperse them to various countries. So I, I was there for four years <laughs> in those displaced person camps uh, in Germany. So, you know, that's the answer. Why four years? If that's what that question was all about. We couldn't go. We couldn't go. We just had to sit there. I think it's kind of uh, important for now because... But you have to read the book. You have to read my yes. book. I had nowhere to go to uh, find out the details. No the choice. Whole history. No choice. You have no choice. You have no choice. You can't move. You can't change. You can't do this. You can't do that because you're under... And we were fed by the United Nations Refugee Organization. And that's where the tragedy between the refugees today and the ref refugees after the first, Second World War. That we were fed. We were there, we sat there, or just in those uh, various camps. But we were fed, we were taken care, not like today. That's the tragedy of today, that nobody can take care of them. Impossible. Other questions? We were almost like privileged. Everybody was watching, you know, every day going, you know, eight o'clock or whatever. And we were just <laughs> sitting there doing nothing. Well, uh, uh, about New York, of course, this is the, 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 the other part of the story in, in, in the film. And um, I'd like to know that, I mean, I mean, it's not natural to come to the United States and stay in New York. Had you I did not even did come to New York. I was brought there York, and dropped yes, there. Yes. But luckily it was New York. Uh, that's what They I could have to... dropped me anywhere else, in yeah. uh, Alaska or that... some. That's what I wanted to know. When did you decide to stay? I mean, you made your luck in a way in, in New York, but how, it was how, not even my choice. My how, first choice was on a boat you know, uh, between Rio Havre and uh, Sydney, Australia. They just uh, it was decided by the United Nations to drop me there because United States needed workers. Did you ever think of going anywhere else? Los Angeles, Chicago? No, 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 I did not. But that time, after the four years sitting there in Castle, really in the suburb of Castle, in a camp, I, I, I didn't care anymore where they dropped me. It's a may as well, you know, let's wait. Let them, they, that civilization landed me there. And I said, you, now you landed me here, now you take care of me. And I, you know, I will wait. Wherever I land, you know, it will be fine. And then somebody said, hmm, we have job for you in Chicago. And they made all the papers there and they put me on the ship and they brought me and dropped in New York. But there I was, in New York. And Chicago was there somewhere. Since we are in New York, we should be go to Chicago. That would be stupid. So well, I know people who love. So we remained in New York, yeah. myself and my brother. You know, there's a there's a funny story about the Italian community in Scotland. Apparently, the best place to have an espresso outside of Roma is Glasgow. Because, you know, uh, again, you know, uh, actually in between the First War and the Second War, 
all these poor Italians from Napoli and you know Sicilia and stuff, they got on a boat and they thought that they were going to New York, but they didn't know anything because and this is the uh, this is why this kind of tourism question that you're asking is really it's a good question but it's a stupid answer it's not fucking tourism you get taken from here to there you don't know where you're landing can i finish my i said i said it wasn't a stupid question A stupid a question are some of the best ones. So don't don't it was not don't worry if it's for, even fucking, if it was. It's <laughs> not a fucking stupid question. Can I finish my fucking story? <laughs> that the Italians in Scotland come off the boat because the boat was refueling. They thought they were in New York, but they were in Glasgow. And then the boat sailed away, and they walk around and say is this New York in <laughs> Italian? And everyone says, no, it's fucking Glasgow, you fuck. <laughs> and then they bring ice cream and coffee to Scotland, and it changed Scotland. And this is quite beautiful. They landed where they landed. It was not, a, I, I, I will reiterate it, it was not a stupid question. I'm giving you a stupid answer. Next. Next. I have a question. Um, in the beginning of the film, um, just after you lost your job in Brooklyn, um, there's this statement that um, you say, uh, I had nowhere to go. And it has a very different meaning, um, I think, in that, in that moment than the idea or the title of, this, of, the, of, of the book. I haven't read the book, but um, what's the difference between, it would be interesting to hear what the difference is between that type of, I had nowhere to go, and the displaced person's concept of I had nowhere, no place to go. I, I don't exactly re remember what uh, that second uh, uh, nowhere to go was. Uh, there is only, you know, one. Uh, okay, once. Uh, you leave your home on your own, you know you, why you are leaving and where you are going. But once you are like uh, pushed out by circumstances and you have no idea, you never wanted to go anywhere, then you are, you, then you are somewhere in the world uh, uh, and uh, you, you, you have no idea where you will be. You know you cannot go back, and you have no idea what's in front of you, and, and, and you don't even at some point don't want to go anywhere, and you don't know. You are, uh, so you live moment from moment to moment, and you deal with the actual reality, <laughs> almost like the camera, we deal with what's in front of the lens. Yes, or, or you live like in, uh, uh, again, like my filming, like Kung Fu. You face reality moment by moment and with no thinking, automatically. Otherwise, you are really lost if you begin to think. Uh, so that's the uh, life of a uh, displaced person. You live like uh, in a, a Kung Fu. Uh, not just do it, but yes, uh, face it, react automatically, and no thinking, moment from moment to moment. That's be that's that became a principle of my life. And you don't care, you don't want to go, really. And maybe uh, this idea of want to go somewhere is, is wrong to begin with. I think we should <laughs> live in the present. 
because and the, all the nationalisms are born from uh, going, wanting to go back home. Uh, 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 my home is everywhere, wherever I am. I l let my roots imitate. I say, leave me in a desert. Come back three days later, I will have my roots already in the desert, deep. Um, Jonas, could you um, tell us about the first time you ever met Douglas and vice versa? <laughs> I, I don't quite remember. Uh, uh, maybe we both had, some, you know, some wine, or so, uh, uh, so that the memory is gone. <laughs> I, I, don't, I actually don't. Long ago, I, it was. I do. Uh -oh. oh, was it in uh, somewhere? Where was it? Was it was somewhere really special in France. You were wearing a blue jacket <laughs> and blue <laughs> jeans because that's what you always wear. And I love that, you know. And we, I don't know, we, we, we met when Jonas was young, 75 or something. I think we may, I don't think I knew it was you, but we met somewhere in New York, uptown or at some place in some... Uh, no? Yeah, when I was young, I was yeah, actually wait yeah. a minute, if I take my glasses off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Forget it. That's not that important. We can go no. to the next uh, question. Yeah. <laughs> next. I have a completely different question. Um, oh, every that's <laughs> good to have a different question. <laughs> when did you translate the text? Because I suppose you uh, speak louder. When did you translate the texts? Because I suppose you um, didn't write them in English, or I, I suppose. For, for I translated story. it uh, some uh, year, many years later, around uh, uh, 85, maybe, yes, 1985. Other questions? But some of it was already written. The, the, the day I. Uh, landed in New York in order to uh, master the language, which I'm still, still trying to master, I began immediately writing in English as a you know, means, tool of trying, of learning the language. So some of it was written already in, in English. Yes. Bad English, but... Um, yeah, I had a comment. Um, I met one of the security guards at the B3 because they all looked really interesting. Like, I wanted to talk to everyone, but I talked to one, and he was from Syria two years ago to Frankfurt, and he also expressed he wished he'd gone to Australia, you know, like for the weather and the beaches. and the. Um, but I just wondered if you meet any current refugees in New York. I live in Amsterdam. I meet a lot of... Syrian refugees and, you know, how your art helped you through the transition? Art never helps any transition. Well, but or, I, I, or I, I diary have, no, writing no. or... No, but instead, mm -hmm. I, I, I would like to, <laughs> to tell you that uh, this is not my first time in Frankfurt. I have been many, 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 many times already in Frankfurt. Uh, immediately after the war, uh, because I was trying to stud study in Mainz. Our camp was in Wiesbaden, and then in the middle of my first term, our camp was transferred to Kassel. So twice a week I used to take a train from Kassel to we to uh, to. Uh, Mainz, and then back, and there was no direct line. You always had to stop the train, Kassel, Frankfurt. And they arrives in the evening, and in the morning, you have to spend the night in Frankfurt, pick up 
train the connection to Mainz. And since there was very little of Frankfurt uh, left, uh, but the railroad station, a great part of it, was still there. And there was a bar. There was a bar. That's, that's really what, what was left of the station also, the bar. So I used to order, you know, a beer, drink my beer, and then used, uh, used to sleep, spend my night in Frankfurt, sleeping on the table like that. So those are my memories of Frankfurt. Many, many, many nights I slept in Frankfurt. Stay, railroad station in the bar. Funnily enough. With leftovers of my beer because I had no money for this. This is the second. big influence from Jonas to me. <laughs> many, many nights I've spent in Frankfurt falling asleep on a bar. <laughs> yes. True. Are there other questions? No rush, no hurry. We, no, come on. We I have, we, for, we I'm playing football at three o'clock. Come on, let's get this thing to go here. <laughs> what was the most difficult aspect of making the film? Was it finding time that your schedules met or, you know? No, I had a, a mental breakdown. That facilitated your... No, I made it difficult to finish. Uh, it's very difficult to sit... I mean, it's a lovely, beautiful idea to make a film with nothing to see. And, you know, the the kind of the provocation, uh, which is a little na uh, naive of me, you know, to think that it's interesting for people to have images in their head. But when I'm editing it, it's a bit difficult. Yes, but when I, when I edit, I never have images in my head. <laughs> no, but you see images, mate. No, no, I don't see them. I have actually no visual memory. That's why I film when I have when I filmed and I see the footage. Aye, but you can look, imagine though. I, I, I edit, edit only by looking at the Im images because I know. I, but I, I have nothing to look at. I'm only hearing your voice, and to yes. sit in a dark yeah. room with your voice. So, sorry. 24 what hours a day? <laughs> I had a breakdown, mate. All right. Uh, you, 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 you can imagine how many hours it took me to read it. <laughs> it's all on tape. Uh, you should bring down the tape audio version. You no, know, I, I still, I mean, uh, there's, uh, uh, let's say this. If I speak about the film as if it wasn't mine, I think this is one of the things that I really love with Jonas is that the films he makes are almost not his. And I it's one of the things I try to do, you know, to sublimate my gigantic Scottish ego, to take myself away from what I'm doing. And, you know, today when I'm sitting up there and the first bomb goes off and I always forget when the bomb is coming. But that makes me think about how it must have been for you when the first fucking bomb goes off. And then I forget when the next bomb is coming. And uh, then actually, the they all come like uh, like an avalanche. When uh, I mean, I, I, I was in the forced la labor was in Elmshorn, the suburb of Hamburg. <laughs> And when I uh, landed in that forced labor camp, Hamburg was still there. And I witnessed the complete destruction. Uh, and that happened quite fast, in just several, maybe two or three waves of uh, massive hundreds and hundreds of bombers. So one. Once it begins, it just goes for exactly about the same length as in the film. Uh, and, and then si silence, they're all back. Then next day, again the same. And by three or four such days, there was no more Hamburg. Yes.
when when we were doing the uh, a small area near Altona station was left like uh, untouched, and that was full an area of bookshops by strange, uh, maybe Goethe was watching, or I don't know. <laughs> and that was miracle which uh, saved some of my sanity, the, the, the bookshops left, because we were permitted once a week to go to Hamburg, what, what's left of it, what, what was left of it, as long as we return on time. Yes. When, when we were doing the sound mix, uh, 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 you know, for me, I'm thinking, thinking, thinking. What would it be like to be in Emshorn in 19, whatever, 40 something? It would probably be the first time you ever heard that sound and this barrage on a daily basis. Bang, 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 boom, boom, boom. And I said to my, you know, fantastic sound uh, guy, I said, Frank, <laughs> ironically, his name is Frank Cruz, if you know what a cruise missile is. I said, Frank, how many bombs have we got in the library? And he said, uh, about 2,500 bombs. All different, all available. What do you want? And that's a gigantic shift in you know, the kind of, let's call it the encyclopedia of sound, from something that would be heard from the first time in 1942, for example, and to 2000 and, you know, 15, 16. We now have a library, an encyclopedia of sound, which encapsulates the experience that people had for the first time only 60 or 70 years ago. And uh, that's a bit daunting for me. That's another reason why I had a breakdown. I will just add with why I was so stupid. I mean, to, to I, I began at the Mainz University, and then we were moved to Kassel. Why go back to Mainz? I mean, what do we, you know? What do we learn in a university anyway? So, but Mainz had. Uh, one little bookshop, which uh, being in the French was, was uh, you see, Germany was divided in the English zone, French zone, American, but Mainz was in the French zone. And there was a little group bookshop, bookshop that had most up-to-date literary and film publications. So I went because of that bookshop, and then there was a f film theater in Mainz uh, that had most up-to-date productions already post war in France. And the first film festival that took place in post-war Germany was in Mainz in 47. Uh, in 47. I still have the program. And where I saw the first you know, post-war productions, and I saw the first Cocteau, the Beauty and the Beast, and, and that was. You know. So uh, where I had got some idea that, ah, oh, cinema, maybe, maybe there is something in cinema. Maybe, maybe. Can I embarrass you by asking you to yeah. tell the story? What is the story? No, uh, uh, I, I didn't know that. Why don't you tell me what story I should tell? Okay, I'll tell the story, maybe. No, I, 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 uh, you begin uh, and oh, I will. Okay, okay. Once upon a time, <laughs> there was a man called Jonas Makas, and he flies from New York to Paris. And he meets... I'm just oh, no. <laughs> now, he, what he's talking is about uh, uh, 
one of the movies for which eventually was uh, arrested for screening of it, that was on uh, Genet's on Jean de Moore. Uh, uh, and uh, I had, had heard about it, that was in uh, 60, 63, uh, about the film. Uh, actually, it was forbidden in France, uh, also, it was it, it, it had no no public screening in France, and I thought I should bring it to New York. Uh, so I go and I uh, meet the co-maker Nico Papatakis, uh, who made the film together with Genet, who was very close during the production. Uh, controlled actually every aspect of the film. I'm talking about the song of love, love uh, on Sean Damour. And uh, now how to get it to New York, because uh, if I come from Paris to New York, the uh, custom people in the airport, they were very suspicious of anybody coming from Paris because they were bringing in smut. Smut, dirty books, Olympia books, etc. So I knew that I will be checked and the film will be confiscated and uh, I don't know what next. So I said, let's cut it to pieces uh, uh, and put stuff it in my pockets, rain po raincoat pockets. And I'm not going from Paris to New York. I will go first to London because to, to come to New York from London is very innocent. You know, who cares about you know, English people coming to, they, they just, you know, you just walk through the customs. So I go to London and then I take a plane with my pockets full of genie. <laughs> and there on the, I, I, but, I, but I still was afraid, you know, that I may be, you know, uh, there is still a, possibility that um, I will be checked carefully. So uh, this happened to, 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 to my neighbor, we, we talk with the seat uh, neighbor, happened to be Harold uh, Pinter. Uh, uh, so he said, you know, I have an idea. Just do nothing. You just watch me. You know, go. I go first and you go second. So we arrive in uh, New York. And uh, he goes first, I go just behind him, and, and the custom people say, okay, open your suitcase, this is to Pinter. So he opens his suitcase, and there is nothing in it but copies, like 50, 60 copies of his new play, which was about to open on Broadway in New York. So what is this, what do, do, those books? He says, oh, you know, I'm playing it and have a play opening on Broadway, and these are just copies. Play on Broadway. You have a show. You have a show on Broadway. And he motions to every, all the other custom uh, you know, agents, no, hey, here, you look a real playwright. He has a play on Broadway. And they were so gaga about it that uh, Pinter just uh, winked, uh, just go. And I just spoke through. While they were still, still, you know, admiring, you know, looking, talking, you know, taking pictures of Harold Pinter, and I said bye bye. <laughs> That's how the print of, of uh, Jean Genet's film got to New York. This is why I have no images <laughs> in the film because the stories are better, you know. But you must say Imagine this. Show. <laughs> when that was a short story, then I got arrested, of course. <laughs> but the arrest, uh, then uh, I followed up with Flaming Creatures. Actually, the, the first arrest was for sh screening Flaming Creatures which I knew was, everybody said, bad. You can get, you know, a year, two years in jail. Then I uh, said, hmm, I will complicate the case. I will have another arrest. And the next week I screened Genet, and I'm arrested again. So, uh, but the prosecutor was smart. He dismissed 
Genet and concentrated and flaming creatures. Because Genet had a play, uh, there was a play <laughs> on, on, on Broadway, and he's famous, and he, he, the prosecutor knew that the film will be defended by you know, famous people, and they will lose the case. But flaming creatures, who cares about this guy, Jack Smith, and his badly made film, flaming creatures, bad pornographic film. And of course, I lost the case. So, um, I had in my defenders, Susan Zontag, <laughs> Alan Ginsberg. <laughs> and you know what happened? A year ago, the prosecutor wrote me a letter apologizing for sentencing me a year ago, just a year ago. Uh, <laughs> times changed. And he changed himself. He apologized for, for prostituting because I lost the case of course, and, and was sentenced six months, suspended sentence. Yes. Okay, so that's history. But it helped to, to, to get rid of censorship, that the case was so much discussed, target pro and against, that it helped to get rid with the next two years. The censorship in New York and much of the states were down, finished. So it was not for nothing. And then it takes. The, and then it pays the, to take a stand. Stand and then for what the, you believe in. The Abby Hoffman story. <laughs> Please, I love it. No, just, no, just for me. No, no, just the for stories me. which I am telling, and uh, uh, you uh, and we could spend the whole day, uh, are uh, really. They are also. I tell them in a book just came out. It's called A Dance with. Fred Astaire. Look for that book. <laughs> uh, uh, this, this is, you know, Abby Hoffman, he was one of the 68 uh, you know, the, the demonstrators, protesters, and went through the you know, courts, and, and he was in jail. And, uh, but uh, uh, and then, of course, he dies. And, and then uh, this happened like five or six years ago that uh, uh, somebody, something went wrong in the apartment where he used to live. Like now somebody else lives there. And uh, a friend of Ben, Ben, our friend Ben. And when the mechanic was uh, fixed, trying to get to find out what's wrong with the with the, all those, the wiring in the building, he, he, it led him to the ceiling somewhere. And there on the ceiling was the whole apparatus of uh, recording, of taping. That, and that's Abby Hoffman's house. <laughs> that means the secret police the, it was uh, had installed the, the, the listening uh, system. <laughs> that uh, they were but following uh, uh, very the, closely what uh, was happening in that there's apartment. One, one evening we are sitting together in uh, in the hotel room in France or something, and Jonas tells me this story that, you know, that Abby Hoffman's kind of big punk idea was, you know, steal this book. Ah, uh, stealing book, yes. You know, please steal this book. The and book, the title of his book later was "Steal This yeah. Book," and Jonas says to me, "It was my idea. He yeah. stole the idea <laughs> from me, and but then. not for the book. Not for the book because when Abby Hoffman was younger, he was running a movie house out of town somewhere, uh, uh, and uh, I had just just finished my first film, Guns of the Trees." And we had nowhere, uh, nowhere to show. Nobody wanted to show it. So somebody said, oh, go and uh, see, uh, uh, call Abby Hoffman. He has a theater. He will show it. So I call Abby, and she says, sure, we'll, uh, just come. And so we come to myself, my brother, and uh, 
one more person. And the, the, the wife of Abby uh, uh, Hoffman uh, panics a little bit because she has nothing to offer, no drinks, no food, no nothing. So we said, don't worry. Uh, we are going out. We'll be back in, you know, 15 minutes. And we go to a store. And during the editing, during that period, we were so broke, and all our friends were so broke. We had mastered a uh, technique of stealing food. But we stole only from a, from a very big commercial store. The name was Safeway. Safeway. We stole it only from Safeway, not from individual, you know, stores, small. And uh, so we go to a safe, a local safe store, and we come back, and we uh, unload ourselves, or, you know, and we to feed the whole family and friends. And Abby panicked. You know, really, you really did that? How could you do that? Said, don't worry, just uh, have a good time. <laughs> and and, uh, and I think that's where the idea still this book <laughs> came from. <laughs> it's a lovely idea in a way that the, the architecture of Safeway in New York is the same as upstate New York. So if you know the architecture of a grocery store, you know it everywhere. So you know exactly what to do in each location. And they did not have that system with uh, uh, cameras. Uh, no, that was not there yet. Are there any other questions? Don't do that. <laughs> not today. Not advisable. Uh, yes, um, Jan, you seem to still know quite a few Lithuanian songs, and the one you sang at the end of the film. Um, sounded like it might have been written based on your life. It was pretty sad. Um, do you sing often? And um, why do you think those Lithuanian songs are so sad? Uh, oh, can you repeat your sort of mumbling? mumbling oh, yeah, oh, yeah. Oh, all right, I, I try to, 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 yeah? to repeat it. Uh, you seem to still know some quite, qu qu quite a few Lithuanian songs. And so you sang one at the end of the film. And uh, it was... Uh, it was pretty sad. Uh, do, do, do you sing often? Do you still...? Not by myself. Uh, uh, Lithuanians don't sing, but they whistle by themselves. All right. then it, it, whistling is an art that has disappeared, really. Uh, why you walk the road, you know, somewhere by yourself and you whistle, but you don't sing by yourself. You don't sing. But uh, you need uh, one or two. But if there are two Lithuanians, they begin to sing. All right. And the second question, uh, the film was... Uh, it's whistle, about whistle it, whistle it. Uh, I can't. <laughs> yeah. yeah, good. Very good. Yeah. And the second question... Uh, the the but film we is, can, uh, yeah, the film uh, is about two hours, I suppose. Uh, we were all sitting and watching it. But we can sing together, maybe. Maybe, maybe. Okay. Uh, 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 let's uh, do it now. Uh, no, no. Uh, after uh, the question. You just, uh, <laughs> let's do it now. Uh, I, and it's a very simple song. It, 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 it's uh, about two pigeons drinking from a puddle. And that one says, uh, you know, should we drink? Or we should not drink. Maybe we should just fly, fly around. And the song uh, goes like this. Tris karvele klane djere, bederdami sudumojo, ar mums djerti, ar ne djerti, ar ne djerus palačot. Tris karvele klone djere, bedero da me sudomojo, ar mums djerti, ar ne djerti, ar ne djerus palačot. Tris karvele klone djere, 
Вот стал и конвидент синг. Вис карвеле клане дел. Бедер даме суду мою. Армом дерти, арне дерти, арне деру цпала чот. Трис карвеле клун клане дер. Бедер даме суду мою. Армом дерти, арне дерти, арне деру цпала чот. Чуть карвеле клане Бедер, бедер, да, ми суду мой, Армут дерти, арне дерти, Арне деру цепалатет, Трис карвели клоне дери, Бедер, да, ми суду мой, Армут дерти, арне дерти, Арне деру цепалатет. I, s I still have uh, one question. Uh, <laughs> the film was quite long, it's about two hours, I suppose. We were all watching that film. What were you doing that, in that time? What's the question? Uh, what were you doing while we were watching the film? You've gone too far. I had, I had a double espresso, a triple espresso, and then quadruple espresso. Okay, I think come to be uh, center. Mm -hmm. There is, I think it's the running time is almost six hours of different films from Jonas Mikas' uh, work, and he takes us on a an adventure in time and space. And in terms of song, uh, do you want to tell me what did uh, 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 Brittany? Uh, <laughs> Your work on Brittany. Uh, what the question? About your film about Britney Spears. Oh, uh, if you want to show uh, to see my film about Britney, you go to my website, uh, Mekas Jonas at A O L. Uh, no, no, if, I mean jo Mecca, Jonas Mekas Films dot com. Jonas. Me to show the range of his musical interests. And you can see there a lot, including the Britney Spears. Film.